Brazil's foreign minister, Mauro Vieira, opened a G20 meeting in Rio de Janeiro by calling for reforms of multilateral institutions like the United Nations, criticizing their failure to prevent global conflicts like those in Ukraine and Gaza. Brazil, as the current president of the G20, aims to address poverty, climate change, and global tensions, proposing reforms to increase representation of developing nations in organizations like the UN, WTO, and multilateral banks. President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva advocates for expanding the UN Security Council to include more countries and eliminating the veto power of individual nations. However, the success of these reforms is uncertain. As permanent Security Council members have resisted previous reform attempts, Brazil expresses concern about global conflict proliferation and advocates reallocating military spending to development aid. Lula recently met with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to discuss global governance and the Gaza conflict, which has strained relations between Brazil and Israel after Lula's controversial remarks comparing Gaza to the Holocaust. Despite diplomatic tensions, Brazil, under Lula's leadership, aims to re-engage in global diplomacy, with upcoming G20 meetings focusing on finance and foreign affairs. Israel intercepted a potential attack by Yemen's Houthi rebels near the port city of Eilat as tensions rise over Israel's conflict with Hamas in Gaza. Sirens sounded in Eilat, followed by videos showing what seemed to be an interception in the sky. Israel identified the interception as carried out by its aero missile defense system, designed for long-range ballistic missiles. The target, originating in the Red Sea, did not cross into Israeli territory or threaten civilians. The Houthis, who did not immediately claim the attack, have targeted Eilat in the past without causing damage. The rebels continue assaults over Israel's Gaza operations, targeting ships in the Red Sea. Despite U.S. lead airstrikes, the Houthis persist in significant attacks, demanding Israel halt Gaza operations. Recent incidents include damaging a ship and downing a U.S. drone. The U.S. military countered Houthi threats, acknowledging shooting down a bomb-carrying drone and targeting anti-ship missiles. The U.S. State Department condemned the Houthis for delaying humanitarian aid to Ethiopia, Sudan, and Yemen through reckless attacks on civilian cargo ships. The international community criticizes the Houthi actions, which they claim are not aiding the Palestinians in Gaza. The United States vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, with the vote being 13 to 1, with the UK abstaining. This marks the third time the US has opposed such a measure. The resolution was drafted by Algeria and aimed to halt the conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. The US argued that an immediate ceasefire would undermine negotiations involving Egypt and Qatar to secure the release of hostages taken by Hamas. Washington expressed concerns that the resolution did not require Hamas to make concessions in return for a ceasefire. Other Security Council members criticized the U.S. veto, emphasizing the need to protect civilians and facilitate humanitarian aid in Gaza, where thousands have been killed in the ongoing conflict. In response, the U.S. floated its own resolution calling for a temporary pause in hostilities and warning against Israel's planned ground offensive in Gaza. Israel's ambassador to the UN criticized the focus on the term ceasefire, suggesting it oversimplifies the complexities of the situation. Arab states are considering bringing a similar resolution to the UN General Assembly and plan to continue pushing for an immediate, permanent ceasefire. Former CIA Chief Robert Gates expressed concern that the conflict in Ukraine is no longer at a stalemate but rather sees Russia gaining momentum. He noted that Russia has regained offensive momentum, pushing combat lines further east after the strategically significant city of Avdiivka fell to Russian forces. Ukrainian struggles with weapon and ammunition supplies have contributed to their losses, with reports indicating a significant disparity in artillery fire between Ukrainian and Russian forces. The U.S. has provided substantial military aid to Ukraine, totaling over $44 billion since the conflict began. However, a $60 billion aid deal for Ukraine faces potential blockage by House Republicans, delaying crucial support for Ukrainian forces. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby emphasized the urgent need for congressional action, warning that Ukrainian soldiers bear the burden of inaction. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has indicated that once Ukraine receives F-16 fighter jets from allies, it will possess the right to self-defense, including the capacity to target legitimate Russian military objectives beyond Ukrainian borders.
Stoltenberg emphasized that the timing of the deployment of F-16s to Ukraine cannot be precisely determined but stressed the importance of thorough training for pilots and preparation of support personnel. While each NATO ally will independently decide whether to supply F-16s to Ukraine, Stoltenberg underscored that the war in Ukraine is aggressive, affirming Ukraine's right to self-defense. The European Union is on the brink of approving the release of 6.3 billion euros, 6.8 billion dollars, in post-pandemic aid to Poland, possibly as soon as next week, signaling confidence in the new government's efforts to improve relations with Brussels. The European Commission is reportedly satisfied with recent political commitments made by Poland, which address rule of law concerns that have previously stalled the disbursement of nearly 60 billion euros in grants and loans. Prime Minister Donald Tusk's coalition, elected in October on promises to repair ties with European allies and reverse democratic erosion, stands to benefit from the EU's decision. The aid approval hinges on conditions related to judicial reforms. A contentious issue between Poland and the EU, with President Andrzej Duda, a previous government ally, holding veto power over legislation. To meet EU requirements, Tusk's government has implemented temporary measures to address judicial concerns and has sought to align with EU legal principles. Additionally, Polish officials have presented a roadmap in Brussels outlining plans for legislative changes to resolve ongoing conflicts with the EU. The potential approval of post-pandemic aid could also unlock further cohesion funds for Poland. This development marks progress in a strained relationship between Poland and the EU, which has been fraught with legal disputes and financial penalties. Hundreds of farmers drove their tractors into central Madrid in a massive protest against European Union and local farming policies, demanding action to mitigate rising production costs. Organized by the Union of Unions, the protest marks the culmination of over two weeks of daily demonstrations across Spain. The farmers, flying Spanish flags and carrying banners declaring, there is no life without farming, and farmers in extinction, rallied outside the agriculture ministry headquarters. They voiced frustration over the inability to sustain livelihoods from rural industries and called for support for their work. Similar protests have occurred across the EU, with farmers criticizing EU policies that they argue burden them financially and make their products more expensive compared to imports. In Spain, farmers also lament the lack of enforcement of a law ensuring fair prices from major supermarket buyers amidst soaring consumer prices. France, the EU's largest agricultural producer, has witnessed similar protests, prompting Prime Minister Gabriel Adel to promise legislative action to improve farmers' income and simplify farming operations. Concerns over imports from Ukraine were also raised, with efforts underway to protect French farmers from potential market disadvantages. Russian media outlets and propagandists have reported the suicide of pro-war blogger Andrei Mers Morozov, who allegedly took his own life due to conflicts with leading Russian propagandist Vladimir Solovyov and his associates. Morozov released a lengthy post on Telegram, stating that he decided to commit suicide after being pressured to delete a post about the deaths of 16,000 Russian soldiers in the battle for the town of Avdiivka. He accused political prostitutes led by Vladimir Solovyov of forcing him to remove the post. Earlier, propagandists Yulia Vidyazeva and Armin Gasparian criticized Morozov on Solovyov Live, calling his post defeatist and slanderous fake news. Morozov's suicide was confirmed by lawyer Maxim Pashkov and the wife of Russian nationalist Igor Strelkov. Morozov had been associated with the Russian-backed Militia of the Luhansk People's Republic terrorist organization since 2014. U.S. President Joe Biden and the American Coast Guard are taking measures to address cybersecurity concerns related to China's presence in the country's port infrastructure. Biden will sign an executive order mandating maritime vessels and facilities to enhance their cybersecurity measures and report cyber incidents. Additionally, the administration plans to invest over 20 billion US dollars in US port infrastructure over the next 5 years, with a focus on onshoring American crane manufacturing. Rear Admiral Jay Van, commander of the United States Coast Guard Cyber Command, announced that cybersecurity requirements will be imposed on owners and operators of Chinese manufactured cranes in the US. Concerns have been raised about the potential for Beijing to remotely operate these cranes to disrupt goods flow and collect data revealing information about U.S. military shipments. Chinese manufactured cranes, particularly those from state-owned Shanghai Jenhua Heavy Industries, ZPMC, comprise the majority of ship-to-shore cranes in the U.S., posing security risks due to cyber attacks and espionage. 
the Coast Guard will establish baseline cybersecurity requirements for the entire marine transport system to address these risks. China's embassy in Washington has dismissed concerns as paranoia-driven, emphasizing the importance of bilateral trade and economic cooperation. Biden's executive order will expand the Coast Guard's authority to respond to cyber threats, including controlling vessels suspected of posing cyber threats. China and India have completed the 21st round of core commander-level talks aimed at addressing their long-standing border dispute. The negotiations, held at the Chizhul Moldo meeting point on the line of actual control, focused on achieving a complete disengagement along the line in eastern Ladakh. Both countries described the talks as positive and constructive, agreeing to seek a mutually acceptable solution at the earliest opportunity and to maintain peace on the ground in the border areas. The border dispute between China and India spans thousands of kilometers along the Himalayas and has seen repeated standoffs and clashes over the years. The current round of talks began in May 2020. With a focus on disputes along the western section of the line of actual control. Despite efforts to resolve tensions through dialogue, the deadliest conflict in decades occurred in the Galwan Valley in June 2020, resulting in casualties on both sides. Since then, both countries have continued military exercises and infrastructure development in the region while emphasizing the importance of ongoing communication to ensure peace along the disputed frontier. As Tibetans mark 65 years since the failed uprising against Chinese rule on March 10, 1959, and as questions arise about the Dalai Lama's successor, the elected leader of the Tibetan diaspora, Penpa Tsering, says that Beijing is crushing his people. Tsering acknowledges the difficulties of seeking a resolution to the Sino-Tibetan conflict with the much more powerful China but remains committed to the cause of a free Tibet. The 88-year-old Dalai Lama's successor is a contentious issue, with many expecting Beijing to name its own candidate, leading to rival nominations. Tsering emphasizes that the Dalai Lama still has decades to live, according to his own words, and expresses hope for a resolution to the Tibetan cause during the spiritual leader's lifetime. Despite the challenges, Tsering remains engaged in back-channel contacts with Beijing and asserts that the cause for Tibet continues. The recent data leak from Chinese tech security firm iSoon has revealed extensive cyber espionage activities, including breaches of foreign governments, democracy organizations in Hong Kong, universities, and even the NATO military alliance. The leaked data, posted on GitHub, contains chat logs, presentations, and lists of targets, providing concrete details of China's cyber espionage ecosystem. iSoon services included hacking social media accounts, remotely accessing and controlling individuals' computers, breaching smartphone operating systems, and custom hardware for data extraction. The leak also exposed bids for contracts in Xinjiang and revealed the fees hackers could earn for their services. The leak is expected to have significant diplomatic repercussions and may highlight vulnerabilities in the national security of affected countries. Chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on China, Mike Gallagher, stated that support for Taiwan is extremely strong in the U.S. Congress. He led a delegation that met with Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen and Vice President Lai ching -ti. The U.S. is Taiwan's most important ally, and tensions between Taiwan and China persist, with Beijing claiming Taiwan as its territory. Gallagher expressed confidence in the continuation of U.S. support for Taiwan regardless of the outcome of the 2024 presidential election. He also warned China against any attempt to invade Taiwan, calling it incredibly foolish. Former Cambodian leader Hun Sen visited Thailand's ex-premier Thaksin Shinawat, who was recently released from detention. Hun Sen, known as Cambodia's strongman, provided sanctuary to Thaksin during his 15-year exile and named him a special advisor. Thaksin's return to Thailand is closely monitored as he may exert influence on the government led by his family and allies. Thaksin, aged 74 and reportedly in poor health, was released on parole due to his condition. The meeting between Hun Sen and Thaksin was said to have avoided political discussions, but their close ties are seen as significant in the region's elite politics and could impact bilateral issues between Cambodia and Thailand.